In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As most of you know, if you've been reading my From the Pastor newsletter articles, and of course you've all been reading my From the Pastor newsletter articles, I love my music, right? Back in the day, I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things, right? Okay? But when these things came, and I heard about how much better sounding they were, I got rid of a lot of these, and I replaced them with this version. But, of course, with everything be old being new again, these are hot, right? So now I'm bin diving and trying to rebuy my favorite records I grew up with and I've gotten rid of over the years. Now I'm still waiting for uh, leisure ships to come back, however, so that, um, that's coming. Now, of course, some of these old records have not been taken well care of over the years. That's why I can do the, handle it this way, because this, is, this does not play, okay? And they're not well taken care of by the people who had them. They're a little moldy smelling, a little or a lot scratchy, and are less than in pristine condition. Now, you might wonder if with so much music available on on uh, on streaming format or or even on CDs or whatever why we want to listen to the old records that do we do it for that wonderful fresh analog sound for nostalgia that comes with the pops and crackles of that old Herman Hermits album now personally i absolutely love my LPs and they are vinyl, not vinyls, by the way. That's a whole other thing. But sometimes those, though, those old recordings aren't that enjoyable. Now, of course, I'm talking about some of the old records that some of us hear. When we decide that we're going to take a risk or try something new, to step out boldly and do something we haven't done before. And some people who, when they were growing up, were always helped to understand that they were strong and capable and well-equipped to try anything they had in their mind to try. And of course, others, as you know, when they were growing up, were always made to understand that, well, I hate to tell you this, honey, but you're probably not going to work. You're probably going to fail. Might as well not even try. You know, that they'd never succeed. Now, not all these messages are spoken aloud, of course, but they're clearly understood if a child's, in a child's impressionable mind. And sometimes those old records we hear, when we try something, well, they give us courage. And, of course, sometimes those old records make us reluctant to even think about something new, right? Which is it for you? In today's second reading, the Apostle Paul is writing to the people of Corinth. And the way it starts out, you would think that these people, man, they must be superhuman, right? They must be the best of all of God's saints in the entire earth. I mean, he tells these novice Christians that they are, they are sanctified in Christ Jesus, that they are called to be saints, that, they are, that the grace of God has been given to them in Christ Jesus, that they have been enriched in Christ in speech and knowledge of every kind, that, that they are not lacking of any spiritual gift, that they will be strengthened to the end so that they will be blameless on the day of the Lord. And finally, they are reminded that God is truly faithful. That it was God who called them into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Man, oh man. You would think these folks must have been a, just a wonderful group of God's servants, right? Living commendable lives, helping the downtrodden, sharing everything they had in common, giving alms, providing shelter, demanding mercy in the courts for those. All kinds of good deeds must have been rampant in Corinth. I mean, with the buildup of Paul's greeting to these people, 
That's the image that comes to mind. But, and you knew there was a but coming, but in reality, the congregation in Corinth was one of Paul's problem congregations. You know, you heard about those, right? You know, that, you know they're rare. You know, people who grumble and complain about each other in the parking lot. Or the ones who are members who vote not to help spread God's good news. Or the ones who, where the people in the pew smile when they're in church, but boy, how do they sp spread terrible gossip all around town when they leave the worship service? Well, the people of Corinth were all that and more. As we read through the book of 1 Corinthians over the next few weeks, we're going to see all these problems close up. And of course, 2,000 plus years later, we might be tempted to think that, well, you know, that was then and this is now. Paul was talking about those people, not talking about us. But actually, God's word record, recorded by Paul applies to us, us equally across the centuries. The people of Corinth needed to be reminded of their good qualities. They, they need to hear those, those good records playing so that they could look realistically at the challenges that faced them. The people of Corinth, they had, they had budget problems, they, they had hospitality problems, they had evangelism problems, right? Nothing new there, huh? Okay, people of Corinth had budget problems. So it, it, what it was was they were so worried about money that they counted every coin twice. They could squeeze the fertilizer out of a buffalo drachma. Okay? And they weren't always willing to share in their wealth so that the poor in Corinth could survive. People of Corinth had hospitality problems. They, they, I mean, they liked being a close-knit group. They liked doing things together, but um, they weren't so sure that God really intended for them to welcome people into their fellowship. You know, the people who weren't part of the family, the, the, the people who looked a little different or whose heritage was different or who spoke a different language or acted differently from them. And the people of Corinth also had a big evangelism problem. They didn't think they should have to share God's good news with anyone who wasn't already a descendant of Abraham and Sarah. It'd be, it'd be kind of like us today if we refused to share the gospel with anybody who wasn't a Lutheran born or bred and, and who didn't live in the western part of Metro Detroit. All this and yet Paul still tells the people how blessed they are about how they've been enriched in the Lord, about how they've been given courage in adversity and how God has called them to be saints. Now, Paul was probably this congregation's very first pastor. He probably started his church from a small group of the curious people who gathered in someone's home. And he knew them intimately. He knew them. He knew them faults and all. He probably heard their confessions and encouraged them to turn their lives around because, well, they were loved by God. And undoubtedly, when they first heard that they were counted among God's own children, they were so excited that they went out and they told others, just like the disciples in our gospel reading we heard. They found out that God had chosen them, chosen them for a purpose to spread abroad God's glorious word, to live as a light to the nation so that salvation might reach to the end of the earth, as Isaiah tells us. Well, my family of faith, you and I, have been chosen also. We have all been chosen not to get bogged down in, in social cliques or budgets or prejudices. God has blessed us has enriched, enriched us in so many ways. He's given us courage and adversity and has called us to be saints. There's a true story. I've, I've told the story before. I'm going to tell it again about a man by the name of John Morris. 
Now, John Morris built a house in the 1780s in Rutherfordton, North Carolina. And using flint and steel, John Morris started a fire in his fireplace. Nobody knows why, but it became a point of pride in the Morris household to, to let, not let that fire go out. So much so that when John built another cabin for his family, coals from the original fire were transplanted from the original fireplace to the new one. Now, the members of the Morris family, they proudly declared that they would keep that fire going in, honor, in honoring the wishes of John, who, discharged, who had charged the family to, quote, this fire must never go out. And that fire became the catalyst for passing down family history and throughout the generations. In the 1920s, the care of the fire came to one man by the name of William William Morris, the great-great-grandson of John Morris. William never married, never had kids, and he was getting to be close to 80 at that point. He tried to inspire his niece and nephew, nieces and nephews with tales of the family fire, but frankly, none of them were interested in keeping that fire alive after Williams was gone. Fire was 150 years old by now, marking a proud family tradition that everybody in the area admired. But would that tradition end when William died? Well, William took it upon himself to make sure it didn't. So he did an interview in the Spartanburg Herald, and a story spread to newspapers all over North Carolina. And then he told a story on the radio. And he began getting phone calls and letters from all over the country many from people with the last name of Morris. The National Park Service, even at one point, considered buying Williams' cabin, fireplace and all, and moving it to one of the national parks where it could become a tourist attraction, and the park rangers then would take care of that fire. By now, the Saluda Fire, named after the town where William Morris lived, had started to spark the public imagination. And preserving the salute of fire seemed like a, a noble undertaking. Well, one day, not too long after the publicity stir over the fire started, one of William's neighbors came over to see him. The neighbor, by the name of Hamp Alexander Owen, had only one thing to say that day. He said, I've come to tell you, I'm going to keep your fire going. Now, he wasn't doing it for the, for the publicity. He wasn't doing it for the glory. He just... He just admired the legacy of it. And he believed that it was a legacy worth preserving. Now, I don't, I don't know when William Morris died, but when Hamp Owens died in 1948, his obituary said that he was, quote, the keeper of the salute of fire. That fire that had been burning continuously for about 170 years. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know if that fire is still going. I don't know, did it die out? Or is it still burning somewhere? Uh, is it being tended by some anonymous soul who believes in what it stood for? I don't know. Like the people of Corinth, you see, we, we sometimes need to, to be reminded that we're not alone in this. And alone in this mission that God has called us to. That our creator knew us before we were even knit in the womb. Before we were formed, God had a purpose for each and every one of us and for God's church. And when those old recordings play in our heads, whether they tell us to take a risk or just forget about it and let the fire die out, well... Let's filter those old records. Filter those old records through the ones that God has started playing long before we were born. That we can step out boldly into the future because if we have faith, we have been promised by God that we will be strengthened in his service 
and for his service that God has called all of us to perform. My family of faith, I pray that we remain faithful to God's calling and that we will keep those fires burning in our hearts and in our church. Amen.